Good morning and welcome. Amidst the swirl of life's ch challenges, fears, and even moments of crisis, I make time to gaze at the night sky and to see the vastness there, and to remember that, in, that this moment in time is but a flicker, not an inconsequential flicker, for what I do and think now matters. My work, though, is to let the debris of this world pass by while I anchor myself to what I know is true. Love, kindness, compassion, and caring for this precious life, this precious planet, and all that call this place home. This is my North Star. With love as my guide, how can I possibly be wrong? Good morning to you all and welcome to our service here on August 22nd at First Parish Church in Weston. I'm Sarah Napoling, the Assistant Minister for Families and Community Outreach. We're delighted to be back this morning in our sanctuary holding technically an in-person service with our health and safety precautions in place. And with the exciting weather today, we are also very grateful to be live streaming our service today on Zoom. We are recording this service, and an edited version will be available later today online or sometime tomorrow. During these unusual and challenging times, all of us are finding new and different ways to stay in touch with one another. And I'm so proud of all the ways our community has continued our weekly service virtually and in person during such unpredictable circumstances. We're looking forward to connecting in community and renewing our spirits over and over again. Today, we are pleased to welcome Laura Wagner, who will be our guest preacher. Laura is the executive director of UU Mass Action, which is the UU State Action Network for Unitarian Universalists in Massachusetts. UU Mass Action works to organize and mobilize Unitarian Universalists towards local and legislative progress. Our organist and pianist this morning is Jeffrey Weeding, and our music director is Bill Sano. Our service is being live streamed, recorded, and produced today by Max Hall with assistance from members of our AV team who wish to remain anonymous. And now I invite you to rise in body or in spirit to sing or hum our hymn, number 1515, This Is Our Song.
And now Laura Wagner and I will light our chalice this morning. For the gift of this day and for our community of spiritual nature and compassion, we give thanks. We light this chalice as a symbol of our faith. May our many sparks meet and merge in communion of heart and soul. And now the peace of God be with you, and also with you. And we invite you to take a moment now and greet those nearby you and offer them a sign of peace and welcome. For those of you who are watching online or on a recording, we invite you to join with us in a virtual exchange of peace. Take a moment to reach out to someone you know by text message or an email or just a quick phone call. Offer them a greeting and a brief word of peace and love during these difficult times. Our scripture this reading is Psalm 20, a prayer for victory. The Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and give you support from Zion. May he remember all your offerings and regard with favor your burnt sacrifices. May he grant you your heart's desire and fulfill all your plans. May we shout for joy over your victory. And in the name of God, set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. Now I know that the Lord will help his anointed. He will answer them from his holy heaven with mighty victories by his right hand. Some take pride in chariots and some in horses, but our pride is in the name of the Lord our God. They will collapse and fall, but we shall rise and stand upright. Give victory to the King, O Lord. Answer us when we call.
Good morning to all of you again, and thank you so much for inviting me to be here with you all today. I'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement. Here in Weston, we are on the unceded land of the Pawtucket and the Massachusetts. It's important to acknowledge the painful history of genocide and forced removal from this territory and to honor and respect the many indigenous people still living on these lands. In making this acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous sovereignty and commit to dismantling the systems of oppression that have displaced indigenous peoples. Our faith calls us to name the crimes committed by colonial settlers against indigenous people and to work to dismantle systems of oppression that continue to harm black, indigenous, and people of color today. I think the importance of why we must confront our history is best reflected in, J in the James Baldwin quote when he said, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. Now is the time to face the fact that racism is an existential threat in to this country. The possibility of what we can become as a nation is within our grasp. We can embark on a new way of being and redefine who we are as a community, a state, and a nation. But this won't happen unless white America is ready to get real, let go of the myths, and start listening. And it won't happen until we understand what it means to work together. One of the most important things we can do right now is really listen to people who have been the targets of institutionalized systemic oppression. We need to think about how we will work to be, to be in right relationship with each other when thinking about how we create more just social and economic systems. When engaging in justice work, it's also important to be deeply connected to one another on an emotional level. You use love to live in our intellectual world, but it's so important to be connected on an emotional level, to create space, to be able to listen and understand one another. Fighting for justice so often leads to despair. If we want to stay committed, we need to stay connected. My motivation to fight for justice is rooted in the pain I had to overcome in my early years. I am a survivor of an abusive childhood. By the time I was 14, I knew I could no longer survive in my house, and I left. The first time I left, I made it on my own for about two weeks, and then I was arrested. And from that moment and for the next 10 months, the people who thought they were helping me placed the focus on me, what I did wrong, and the changes I had to make. Well-intentioned people tried to teach me about the importance of school and family and told me that if I just hung in there, my teenage years would pass and my adult life would be so much better. What was happening in my home was not addressed and the people who caused so much harm were not held accountable. My experience was irrelevant to those who intervened and their goals for me were instead prioritized. We see this approach often repeated in charitable nonprofit work. In her book, The Shock Doctrine, Naomi Klein shares a cautionary story that exemplifies this point. The 2004 tsunami decimated much of the coastal communities along the Indian Ocean. Many of the people hardest hit were the fisher people living among the coastal shores. The tsunami wiped the beaches clean, killing hundreds of thousands of people in 14 countries. In many of these countries, the governments had coveted the land for years and wanted to remove the people so that they could build expensive resort hotels. In one Sri Lankan community, immediately following the tsunami, the first thing the government did was erect a fence to block the survivors from returning to what were their coastal homes. The people re were relocated far inland in a desolate area and provided tin and particle board shelters that were supposed to be temporary. They were not temporary. The people forced to live in these sweltering shacks without running water were soon forgotten 
and the billions of dollars of international relief money intended for the people who lost everything went instead to build $800 a night resort hotels. In the midst of this cruel injustice, a well-meaning NGO arrived and with little understanding of the situation provided what they thought was help in the form of a couple of canoes. From a distance, this may have seemed like a good idea, but in reality, the canoes were simply a cruel reminder of the people's former life. People who were now relocated far inland, barred from access to the sea, and desperately poor. The people who delivered the canoes probably felt good about their gift and had no idea the pain they had caused. For me, the story is a stark reminder that at UUMass Action, I never want to be the organization that delivers canoes. I often think about that first early intervention in my youth. I finally told the people in power what they wanted to hear and I was released. But nothing had changed in my home and I left again. This time I was gone for a year, during which time I learned a lot about how marginalized people live, the impact of systemic oppression, and what it feels like to be outside the circle of humanity. I learned what it means to be a sacrificial person. Eventually, the time came when survival meant leaving the life I was living. Enough had changed that I was able to return home. And when I was ready to make this change, there were pathways available to help me meet my goals. I had a place to call home, without which very little else can be accomplished. I was able to find a job because I didn't have a criminal record, which would have made this exceedingly difficult, if not impossible. I'm often reminded of my story and how not having a criminal record benefited me when fighting for justice with others by working to reform our criminal law system. I invite you to take a moment now and think about a time when you needed help. Who listened? Who listened deeply enough that they didn't bring you a canoe? If you wish, go ahead and say that person's name aloud wherever you are right now. When the resources exist that actually meet a need, people have a much better chance of overcoming obstacles. I was able to eventually pass a high school equivalency test because a program that I could access existed. I earned my college degree because I was able to get a job at a large corporation that offered a college tuition program, and I was able to attend classes at night. I share my story because it demonstrates, it demonstrates the damage caused by good intentions and not listening to impacted people. I didn't need people telling me about the importance of honoring family. I needed a family that wouldn't hurt me. I also didn't need anyone teaching me about the importance of education. I wanted that more than anything, but it's exceptionally difficult for a student to learn when they don't have a stable home life. If my early intervention experience was different, my story would be very different. We do not have the time or resources to, to waste on misinformed good intentions. If we want things to change, we have to be prepared to listen to those who are struggling and address all the pressing problems we face today quickly and effectively. My experience is likely different from many of you listening today, but I'm sure there are parts to which many of you can relate. You know what you need in your life, but too often we find ourselves in situations where people have power over us and are quick to impose their demands and expectations for outcomes on us. This is painful for any individual. It's also painful for a community of people, especially those communities that are the target of racist policies and are marginalized and neglected as a result. We have entered unprecedented times and we are called to completely change the social contract and the systems that are causing so much harm to so many people. Naomi Klein tells us that the economic and social systems that operate now rely on the acceptance of sacrificial people and places. Our economy is based on the pursuit of the cheapest labor source, not on the well-being and respect of workers. 
The climate crisis and our dependence on fossil fuels perpetuates the need for sacrificial people and places. For generations now, we have known that places like Cancer Alley in Louisiana exist, which have condemned the people living there to a lifetime of illness and disease, and now fracking and the extraction of oil on indigenous land pollutes the land and air we breathe and threatens water sources for countless people causing harm that will last generations. Sacrificial people and places must no longer be tolerated. We need to start listening to those who are being harmed and not bring them canoes when what they tell us they need is justice. We have environmental justice communities right here in Massachusetts, communities like Chelsea and East Boston and also Springfield and Holyoke, which have the highest rates of asthma in the country. And they're already paying too high a price for our collective dependence on dirty energy sources and have been fighting for change for many years. The toxic conditions in which the people in these communities are forced to live have taken a significant toll on their health and well-being. The pandemic has forced us all to pay attention to the environmental impacts on health. It also exposed the conditions that result when communities are neglected and underfunded for generations. The pandemic has made it clear that access to medical care, safe housing options, toxins in the environments and the economy are all risk factors in people's well-being. It took this tragedy to remind us that we are all connected. This moment calls for radical change and a comprehensive response that sacrifices no one. For decades, scientists and environmental activists have been sounding the alarm and calling for a seismic shift in how we think about energy. This radical shift in thinking needs to be extended to housing, transportation, health care, both physical and mental health, employment, and more. The systems in place are not working and they are perpetuating harm. In the beginning, when the lethality of the pandemic sunk in, whole states went into shutdown. People completely shifted how they lived their lives. And in the networks that existed, people immediately shifted their support to those whose survival was most precarious. I'm proud to say that at UUMass Action, we raised almost $70,000 in just a few short weeks at the beginning of the pandemic. And we provided these funds to our partners who in turn provided crucial support to immigrants and people who are in prison. I'm so proud to learn that here in Weston, you all raised $200,000, if I'm not mistaken, to support your neighbors in Waltham who were most at risk. That is our values in action. That's what it looks like. It was a clear example of this, these, the, how we supported and stepped up our communities is a clear example of what can happen when we listen to those who are most impacted and provide them with what they actually need. It's an example of understanding our connection to a situation and the relationships we value most guide our actions. Our understanding of the Black Lives Matter movement also became much clearer following the death of George Floyd. The January 6th events in DC were yet another clear reminder of how interactions with the police vastly differ between white people and people of color. To be clear, I do not uniformly condemn all police officers. The problem is not about individuals. It's about systems and the power that those systems have over individuals. It's the systems of oppression that need to change. We are called in this moment to understand the underlying injustice that is the root of climate disruption, economic inequality, food and housing instability, access to medical care, the threats faced by migrants, mass incarceration, and the threats to our democracy. I know this feels overwhelming for many of you, and I'm often asked, how can we possibly work on everything at once? The answer is, we have no choice. This does not mean that every person has to actively engage in every issue. That's not even possible. 
What we need is a unifying vision that centers the priorities of those who are most impacted. We are each called to do the work that moves us while also understanding this unifying vision. For me, it helps to think about this in terms of building a house. Building a house requires special skills such as those of a plumber, an electrician, a carpenter. Each has a specialized skill set and they don't have to know everything about how to build a house, but they do have to work together with the same shared understanding of the house they are building. We are called to understand the house we are building together in this moment, and it needs to be big enough to fit everybody. We each need to contribute based on our own skills and what we are passionate about. It also, it's also important to know that what we are building actually meets a need and we're not just showing up with a couple of canoes. We can address all this at once. At UU Mass Action, our commitment to you is to provide pathways in which you can actively live our shared values and principles. We work in partnership with coalition members where the voices and leadership of those who are most, are most directly impacted are centered. We understand how difficult it is to dismantle systems of oppression and that it cannot be done alone. It's crucial that we all understand what it means to build power that's strong enough to create the world we want to live in. I was saved because I finally found the people who listened to me and provided what I needed, not what someone else thought I needed. We are each called to listen to one another and truly be in relationship. Each and every one of us is needed in this moment. We need to educate ourselves and deepen our understanding of what's happening around us. We need to be in right relationship with one another and listen to those who are most impacted. We have to commit to action and not let what we can't do get in the way of what we can do and we must remember to take care of each other along the way. I hope we can continue to count on you. We need each other now more than ever. Blessed be, may it be so. I invite you now to enter a spirit of prayer and meditation. And as you center yourself wherever you are, let's invite and hold into our hearts those who are most in peril right now. The migrants of the world who desperately seek some sense of safety somewhere on the planet, particularly the crisis of, the, of the, what the Afghani, Afghani people are experiencing right now and hold in our hearts the people in Haiti who experienced yet another massive disaster challenging the very lives of their people. And the impacts of climate disruption as we watch what's happening with COVID and the runaway rap fires that are consuming so many acres and the, the peril facing those who are, their water supply is drying up. These can be overwhelming, but let's, as we contemplate and hold that in our hearts, remember that we are called now to be present as never before. And let us settle into that space from these, in, by listening to these words from John Daniel. Among other uh, wonders in our lives, we are alive with one another. We walk here in the light of this unlikely world that isn't ours for long. May we spend generously the time we are given. May we enact our responsibilities as thoroughly 
as we enjoy our pleasures. May we see with clarity. May we seek a vision that serves all beings. May we honor the mystery surpassing our sight. And we, may we hold in our hands the gift of good work and bear it forth whole as we were born forth by a power we praise to this one earth, this homeland of all we love. I invite you now to join me in the, saying the Lord's Prayer together, the words of which can be found in your order of worship. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Laura. We drink from wells dug by our ancestors long ago, and we sit in the shade of trees we did not plant. It is now our privilege and responsibility to plant the seeds for future generations. We will now have our offering for this morning's service. Here in person, we're not going to pass the plates around. Instead, in a moment, I will place one of our offering plates over by the exit or entrance to the sanctuary and you are welcome to make an offering or donation as you are departing. If you're watching at home and would like to offer a gift of support, you can do so by mailing a check to our church office, through your online banking program, or by using our PayPal account. The information for doing so can be found by clicking the Donate button at the top of our website. Regardless of the option you choose, we thank you, the members and friends of this congregation, for continuing to support our church's voice, our presence, and our mission. What we do here matters and is worthy of our support. The offering for the ongoing life and work and collective ministry that is this congregation will now be given and received.
Thank you for joining us today. You're invited to join our in-person fellowship hour, which begins following the service in our very well-ventilated social hall and outdoor garden. There will be no fellowship hour on Zoom today, though we are considering those options potentially in the future. Next Sunday, August 29th, our August summer services continue with guest preacher, the Reverend Dr. Michelle Walsh, a community minister and lecturer at the BU School of Social Work. We invite you to check out our upcoming programs and services. Our regular weekly programs will meet as scheduled. Our knitters and stitchers will gather tomorrow, Monday at noon, unless there are probably weather issues, in which case maybe check with the main office. And our weekly meditation program continues on Zoom, Wednesday mornings at 8.30 a.m. Our Bristol Lodge food preparation uh, will be this Wednesday, August 25th, and you can check out our website for more information. The First Parish Book Group will not gather in August and instead will next meet on Thursday, September 30th to talk about The Code Breaker by Walter Isaacson. A few notable announcements is that yesterday was Paul Penfield's memorial service, which was truly wonderful and a celebration of his life. And that recording is going to be available on our website for those who weren't able to be here in person. So you can laugh and shed tears and remember Paul with joy in your heart. Our next outdoor movie service, uh, movie night, excuse me, will be this coming Thursday, August 26th at 7.30 p.m. We're going to be screening The Greatest Showman, which is a captivating and lively and fun movie about P.T. Barnum and how his circus became the greatest show on earth. And finally, I would like to note that there will be an outdoor end of summer garden party and croquet party, potentially comp co very competitive, at the uh, Parsonage Green on Sunday afternoon August 29th. Look, the invitation and information for that is on our website and in the email newsletter that was sent out to many of you. You can find more information about all of our programs and links for online gatherings in our weekly email newsletter and on the calendar page of our website. If you have any questions about whether in-person gatherings or meetings also have a hybrid or online option, contact the church office. With the ongoing uncertainty about public health and safety, we continue to find ways to support each other, both in person and from a distance. And as like, we like to say, because it happens to be true, it's so wonderful to see so many people stepping up and reaching out during these challenging times. It's what churches like ours do. We leave this gathered community, but we don't leave our connection, our concerns, our care for one another. Our service to each other, to the world, and to our faith continues until we are together again, friends. Be strong, be well, be true, be loving. <laughs>